morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, or whenever you are joining us today, I want to thank you for joining us for online worship from First United Methodist Church of Hanover in Hanover, Pennsylvania. Uh, we are just a few days away from Thanksgiving. Uh, we are continuing to hear the words of Jesus from the, the Bible. So I'm sure that throughout this coming hour of worship, you're going to hear something and experience something through the the Holy Spirit, that's going to bring back to your mind something that maybe you've overlooked, uh, something that you've been taking for granted, something that you want to say thank you to the Lord for, because our blessings are all around us. And despite the, the, the conflict and the, the division and the suffering that is all around us and all the craziness and weirdness of the year 2020, please never forget that this still is a very beautiful world. And there is much joy to be found. We're going to shine a little light on that throughout this worship service today. So thank you for joining us, and it's time to sing. Give us thankful hearts, because we know our hearts can be hard and cold. We often hold on when we should let go. We are hoarding when we could be generous, and doubting when we should lean on faith. We are fearful instead of trusting in your everlasting care. Give us again the assurance of your love and care, and fill us with grateful hearts and open hands. Amen.
join me in the affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Hi everybody, welcome to worship. I'm so glad you're here. I have a really cool story today called Thankful. The waitress is thankful for comfortable shoes. The local reporter for interesting news. The gardener's thankful for every green sprout. The fireman for putting fires out. The poet is thankful for words that rhyme. The children for morning story time. The artist is thankful for color and light. The clown for her costume, silly and bright. The doctor is thankful when patients get well. And the traveler for a cozy motel. The dancer is thankful. She loves the beat that stirs her heart and hips and feet. The chef is thankful when pl plates are licked clean. The tailor is thankful for her sewing machine. The queen is thankful for her afternoon tea. Now I have to show you this picture. <laughs> the little girl's pretending to be a queen. The beekeeper is thankful for the honeybee. The mayor is thankful for every vote. And the sailor is thankful for his sturdy boat. The birder is thankful for a new, each new bird. And the pastor is thankful for God's loving word. I gotta show you this pastor. I don't think he looks like Pastor Greg. The crafter is thankful, thankful for glitter and glue. And me, I'm ever so thankful for all of you. Being thankful is part of that attitude of gratitude. But I also wanted to talk a little bit today about how you can make somebody thankful for the things that you do. So I have my little friend here. We're going to call him Theodore. So let's think about ways that Theodore might be thankful for something that you could do. I bet somebody could draw a picture for Theodore. That would be something that he'd be thankful for. Maybe you could make a phone call. That would be something to be thankful for. How about helping mom without complaining? How about being kind to your brothers and sisters? That's a good one. I would be thankful for that. How about helping to carry somebody's groceries? I bet you somebody would be thankful for that. How about smiling? Even if you have your mask on, people can tell if you're smiling. And last but not least, always say thank you to everyone you meet. So there you go. Theodore has all his thankful feathers. Hey guys, let's bow our heads for prayer. We just thank you, God, for loving us and giving us people to love. Help us to remember that you love us no matter what. Amen. 
Hey guys, wash your hands, say your prayers, because germs and Jesus are everywhere. Bye. Our scripture lesson today is Revelation 3, uh, verses 14 to 22. Jesus is still sending letters to the seven churches, and in this letter, he speaks to the church in Laodicea. Hear now the word of the Lord our God. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich. I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the word of the Lord. A man comes home to his wife, and from the moment he comes in the door, he is complaining about his boss. He's just fuming, and his wife, because she loves him, lets him get it out. Hopefully, venting a little bit will make him feel better. But as the days and the weeks go by, his rants last longer and longer. His anger is not relieved by talking about it. It actually seems to be making it worse. His anger is growing. Finally, one night in the middle of dinner, she interrupts him in the middle of his rant. She says, honey, I think we have a problem. I think you are having an affair. A what, the husband asked, shocked. I think you love your boss more than me, she replied. Now, how can you even say that, he demanded. You know I hate that guy. Well, I know, she said. But don't you think it's strange that for someone you can't stand, you sure think about him all the time? You must really love him to give him so much space in your head for free. Now, if you have ever been deeply angry with someone, then you know what a bitter and all-consuming thing hate can be. We think about that person all the time. It can get so bad that sometimes we can't eat, sometimes we can't sleep. Doesn't that sound like something else, though? If you have ever been in love, you know what a powerful, all-consuming thing that love can be. Oh, we think about that person all the time. We are fascinated by them. We are inspired by them. We can't eat. We can't sleep. Now, this is going to sound strange, but love and hate actually have a lot in common. Love and hate are inspired by deep, deep passion. Now, passion doesn't just mean hot and heavy love. Passion is the intensity with which our love is felt. And the word passion comes from the Latin passio, which means to suffer. That's why we refer to the cross as the passion of Christ. It's his suffering on the cross. Love and hate both have an element of suffering attached to it. Do you ever hear of being lovesick? a level of pain that is to be endured because of the love. And ironically, the passion of Christ on the cross is both intense love and intense suffering all wrapped up into the same powerful event. Because he loved us and loves us, he willingly suffers death on our behalf. 
Love and hate have something else in common besides just passion. Love and hate both have an element of obsession wrapped up in them too. Obsession is a thought that is constantly preoccupying or intruding into our minds. The point is, the attention that we pay to something never stops. It never goes away. We are consumed by it 24-7, 365. That was the husband in our opening story. He was lying awake in bed one night at 4 o'clock in the morning just fuming about his boss when it finally hit him. His boss wasn't lying up in the middle of the night thinking about him. His boss isn't suffering because of him. His boss was most likely sound asleep without a care in the world. The husband realized he was obsessed. Now the word obsessed has a very unhealthy ring to it, doesn't it? It sounds like a psychiatric problem, a neurotic compulsive disorder that keeps us so focused on one thing that we miss out on the peace and the joy that are available in lots of other things. Now that should not describe a marriage or a courtship, and it also should never ever describe our love relationship with Jesus Christ. We use other words to describe how our love for Jesus grabs so much of our mind and our attention. We talk about commitment and fascination and inspiration. But whatever it is, it does not keep us from enjoying the beauty and joy in the world around us. Love actually makes the world around us look even more beautiful and enjoyable. And if you've been in love, you know what I mean. Now, in our scripture lesson this morning, Jesus doesn't use the words love or hate. Instead, he uses the words hot and cold. Addressing the church in Laodicea, he says, Because you are neither hot nor cold, because you neither love me nor hate me, because you have no passion for me one way or the other, because you really don't think about me much at all, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Now that word that we translate spit is actually a lot more graphic than just spitting. You know, the way the dentist asks you to rinse and spit. The word is closer to spew, which means to throw up because something is making us nauseous or sick. So what Jesus is saying here is that the Laodiceans literally made Jesus sick. Now that's harsh, but it's also truth. Evidently, hate is not the opposite of love. Love and hate still keep our attention fixed on that other person. The opposite of love is not hate. It's indifference. When we are indifferent, we don't think about the other person at all. It never crosses our mind. They're not important to us. They mean nothing to us. The husband in the story was obsessed. His boss was indifferent. The believers at Laodicea had a lot of other things on their minds besides Jesus. They weren't indifferent about everything. They were a very wealthy city, and they enjoyed all the perks and the privileges and the pleasures that money could buy. They led soft, comfortable, pleasant, respectable lives. Sure, they recited the words about sacrifice and suffering in worship. But let's be honest, they didn't really mean it. Sacrifice was for Jesus. Passion was for Jesus. Suffering was for the kingdom was for Jesus. They were glad to just sit back and enjoy the blessings that his suffering purchased. They attended worship. But Jesus evidently never factored into any of their decisions that they made during the rest of the week. Jesus was never a factor in deciding how to spend our cash or how to earn our cash or how to treat people at work or where to go on vacation uh, or what color the new carpet should be or what they wanted for dinner that night. Jesus would never came up in their minds when they were thinking about all these other things. Because when all you think about is vacations and carpet and dinner and TV, you are never thinking about Jesus. At least not until Sunday rolls around again and we dutifully recite the ancient words and we, we, we read the ancient stories and we sing the favorite songs, all the while glancing at our watches because, hey, kickoff starts in a little over an hour. Now, I'm not accusing anyone with this message, but if these words 
are hitting a little too close to home, please know that it is the Holy Spirit that is speaking to you through these ancient words. And what the Holy Spirit has to say is far more powerful and important than anything that I can say. You see, this, this is a trap that all believers can fall into. It's common to every church in every city in every decade of history. In chapter 3 of Revelation, Jesus is speaking to a congregation that lives almost 2,000 years ago, all the way around on the other side of the planet from us. Yet they sound so familiar, don't they? They sound so much like America in the year 2020, don't they? That's because human beings really haven't changed all that much in 2,000 years. We're still wired the same way. That's why the cross and the scripture and the spirit are so desperately needed by us even now. That's why we develop a holy life of daily prayer and devotion and service and worship because following Christ is meant to be a joyful obsession 24-7, 365. And that's why Jesus speaks up. That's why Jesus reaches out. My favorite part of this lesson is when Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and we will eat together. See, that's not just any door that Jesus is knocking on. It's your door. It's your front door, wherever you are right now. The one you go in and out of countless times throughout the week to run to the grocery store, to go price carpet, to go to work, yes, even come to church. That door Jesus is knocking on. Jesus comes to us 24-7, 365. He is willing and he is wanting to come where we live. He is knocking. So open the door. Let him in. Spend time. Fall in love. Know the passion and the holy obsession of Jesus moving into place. His kingdom moving into place right here where we live. Now, after worship today, I want you to try something. It might sound a little strange, but I want you to try it. I want you to go to your front door, and I simply want you to place your hand on it. Okay? Close your eyes and realize that this very front door, on the other side of it, Jesus comes every day asking and knocking on that door to come in. And if Jesus is touching your front door every day, then it is holy because it's touched by Christ. Remember that every time you pass through that door, whether you are coming or whether you are going, that Jesus stands at that door and knocks. Open it up to him and enjoy a peace and a passion that words cannot describe. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, God bless you. Amen. We are just a few days away from Thanksgiving. Uh, November, we always think about Thanksgiving, and that's also why Deb Lepo has been doing children's messages all month long about that attitude of gratitude. So as I often do, I like to to share uh, prayers and words and thoughts of some other believers in Christ, from the body of Christ, to kind of get our prayers started. Um, One thing you might know from worshiping with us is that the United Methodist Hymnal has a lot more in it than just hymns that we sing. There are a lot of prayers and acts of worship as well. And uh, this prayer, which is actually a communion prayer, uh, is called a prayer for bread and justice. And it's written by Ruben Alves, a 20th century writer in Brazil. And um, one of the reasons why I'm going to be using a communion prayer for Thanksgiving is the prayer that we pray Um, is uh, over the bread and the wine of Holy Communion is called the prayer of great thanksgiving. Uh, That's really what the the act of communion is all about. Um, Thanking God for coming into this world, thanking Jesus for not just coming and being with us, but, uh, but, but fixing things changing things, shining a light in the darkness, calling our attention to some things that we would rather ignore, and lifting up those uh, who other people are uh, ignoring, who need some help. So we're going to go into this time of prayer with the prayer of Bread and Justice by Ruben Alves. Let us pray. O God, 
Just as the disciples heard Christ's words of promise and began to eat the bread and drink the wine in the suffering of a long remembrance and in the joy of hope, grant that we may hear your words spoken in each thing of our everyday affairs. Coffee on our table in the morning. The simple gesture of opening a door to go out free. The shouts of children in the parks. A familiar song sung by an unfamiliar face. A friendly tree that has not yet been cut down. May simple things speak to us of your mercy and tell us that life can be good. And may these sacramental gifts make us remember those who do not receive them, who have their lives cut short every day, in the bread absent from the table, in the door of the hospital, the prison, the welfare home that does not open, in sad children, feet without shoes, eyes without hope, in war hymns that glorify death, in deserts where once there was life. Christ was also sacrificed, and may we learn that we participate in the saving sacrifice of Christ when we participate in the suffering of his little ones. In these common everyday things, O oh God, you reveal holiness. In the bread that we eat, in the laughter of our family, in tears of both joy and pain, you reveal your blessing and your grace. And for each of these everyday, small, wonderful blessings, we thank you from the bottom of our heart. The writer of this prayer, O oh God, refers to them as sacraments. We know that the sacraments are holy. They are common things made holy. It's just everyday bread and everyday juice and wine, and you make it holy with your spirit. It's just common water out of the tap, but you make it holy in baptism by your Holy Spirit. As we shared in our message today, and as Reuben prayed, the sacrament of a common door can be made holy as your Spirit touches it, reaching out to each of us. We ask, O oh God, that you will forgive us of our sins and our mistakes, that you will keep us grateful to never overlook even the smallest and most common blessing, but also, Lord, to not be so consumed with our enjoyment that we overlook those who do not have, that those who are hungry are our responsibility too. That those who struggle are our responsibility too. Give us, we pray, by your Spirit, a bold, red hot passion for you, even if it brings suffering. May you be our holy obsession that brings out the beauty and the joy in everything around us. All this we pray, Lord, for our nation, for our world. Lord, I also want to be sure that we are praying today for our brothers and sisters in Latin America, particularly Nicaragua, who was hammered by a Category 5 hurricane over the week, earlier this week. And the devastation is remarkable. We just pray, Lord, that this world will become more of what you have created it to be. And may your heaven come to this earth. And to that end, together we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Uh, I also want to thank you for the gifts uh, of financial support that you have been sending uh, to support the ministry of First United Methodist Church and to continue to support an, a growing number of uh, very needy people around us. COVID uh, is more than just a mild annoyance or even a great annoyance. It is costing people their jobs. It is costing them their homes, their savings. Uh, their peace. So uh, your giving has helped a lot of people put food on the table. Your giving has continued to um, keep the doors open here so that we can, and the phones ringing, so that we can pray with people, whether in person uh, or over uh, the distance. So I just want to thank you for your giving. And I want to ask a special uh, request, if I can. As I shared over the recent weeks, we have seen that many folks who uh, have worshipped with us regularly for years uh, before COVID uh, have stopped giving or don't give very often now that they are worshipping from home. And I just want to ask, if you have not given in a while uh, to support First Church, or maybe you don't know us face to face, you found us online, uh, if you would like to support this ministry, whether the in-person ministry uh, or the online digital ministry, because both are going to continue for quite some time to come, uh, there are a couple of different ways that you can give remotely to support the ministries of First United Methodist Church. One, you can write a, a check out to First United Methodist Church, put it in the post office, send it to our church office. It's First United Methodist Church, 200 Frederick Street, uh, Hanover, Pennsylvania, 17331. Or you can give electronically uh, through automatic funds transfer. You can uh, set it up so that your bank talks to the church's bank. You've got to talk to our finance office about that. They can help you. Or if you want to go online to our website, we have a program on our giving tab called Easy Tithe, which lets you give remotely using a personal credit or debit card. Uh, and speaking of giving, coming up in a, in a few weeks, there's another way that you can give. Uh, we at First Church are hosting uh, a, a Red Cross blood drive the afternoon and evening of December 7th. Uh, it's going to be held at the social hall at our Middle Street campus that is 200 East Middle Street, parked behind the church, and you can come in the back door. There should be some signs up for the Red Cross. It's December 7th from 1 p.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, if you'd like more information or you want to call to set up a... Uh, uh, an appointment time, you can either call the church office or you can um, check out our church's Facebook page uh, and there's uh, an article on there about the blood drive. So thank you for all of the ways that you give. unsettling, stirring in you from this worship service today. It's okay if it is. 
Sometimes the Holy Spirit will interrupt our peace and disturb us just a little bit because that's what it takes to move us on to something holier, something better. And that's my prayer for you today as we finish this worship service and as we prepare to give thanks to God with our friends and family throughout this week on this Thanksgiving week. That is that you will experience God in a way that brings you closer to Him. I bless you, my friends, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit as we go now in his peace. And remember, from God's house to your house, we are one body in Christ. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Have a great week and come on back next time. Amen.